afternoon everybody. On behalf of the Beverly Hills Bar Association and the Criminal Law Section, uh, we'd like to thank you all for attending this panel. Uh, for those who have not met me, my name is David Kerman. I am a litigation and white collar partner at O'Melveny & Myers and I work out of the Century City office. And as of a few months ago, I am uh, the recently installed uh, chair of the Criminal Law Section. I have been told that this is the first a uh, panel put on by the criminal law section in quite some time. And we hope that it is the first of many interesting panels and events for the section going forward. Today, we are lucky to have an amazing panel to discuss PPP enforcement. I think I speak on behalf of all of us uh, when we wish we could do this in person, but today we will make do uh, with Zoom. And because we're on Zoom, um, we cannot uh, see people's hands for questions. So if there are questions, there is a tab at the bottom of your Zoom titled Q&A. Um, please uh, feel free to type it in there and we will um, answer them as we can. Going back to the topic of uh, today, it really cannot be more timely. As we sit here today, we remain in the pandemic, albeit things are looking up and we are hopefully turning a corner with the vaccine um, and the rates going down. But even when the pandemic ends, um, things go back to some version of normal. And even after the PPP loans have been made and likely forgiven, PPP enforcement, which is what we're here to talk about today, will remain and likely will remain for many, many years to follow. And just for brief background, as uh, many forecasters predicted that during the beginning of the pandemic, the economy was heading towards a recession. As we all know, Congress responded with a historic government funding program that we call the CARES Act. The CARES Act included a number of financial stimulus programs, um, one of which is PPP and which we'll be discussing today. The first PPP package provided $649 billion intended to aid over 5 million small businesses and the purpose was to help them maintain their payroll and some overhead expenses to get them through the period of the emergency caused by the pandemic. Payments were to be deferred and the principal of the PPP loans could be forgiven up to the total cost of certain expenses such as payroll. And more recently, uh, at the end of December, 2020, Congress passed what we call PPP2 which authorized another $325 billion in aid. So those are all the basic facts that we know. We've read about all of those things uh, in the news, but there are some things I think uh, that are particular to this panel um, that are not so apparent. Uh, and we're gonna go through a few of those just to set the table. The first is that PPP was intended for small business owners. But most small business owners don't typically in interface with the government to get money. And when they took PPP loans, they became something similar to a government contractor or government grantee. This fact could not be more important. Most government contractors uh, that deal with the government frequently understand the seriousness of information provided to the government for money. They typically have lawyers, accountants, auditors, and consultants who assist them with the applications in the process. In contrast, 
most PPP applicants had none of that infrastructure. Compounding the situation, PPP applications were submitted quickly um, by virtue of the emergency. And on the opposite side of the same coin, funds were paid quickly with little to no verification of eligibility, much less any face-to-face -face meetings like you would get um, in, a, in a different type of loan situation. And the PPP appears to have worked. The vast majority of money was paid to needy companies who qualified and who used the, the loans correctly. But by virtue of uh, speed, instead of scrutinizing the applications before paying for the funds, which really cannot be done consistent with the urgency that was caused by the pandemic, the government has what us former prosecutors sometimes call a pay and chase strategy, meaning you pay the money first without doing a lot of diligence, and then you go after the bad actors later. And so all of this created somewhat of a perfect storm for bad actors to abuse the system and try to get loans or for bad actors to stretch information contained in their applications. And even for those who actually needed the funds um, and who correctly applied for the funds, uh, the sort of the speed and the amounts could create temptations to use the funds for purposes that were not allowed by the loan terms. And so all of that brings us to today. And as a result of the factors and things that I just talked about, PPP enforcement has become a government priority. And we are starting to see the chase part of the pay and chase strategy with a number of criminal indictments and more recently, even some civil enforcement. And so today we have three exceptional panelists who will give you different perspectives on how the government has been and will likely address these issues going forward. And I'd like them to introduce themselves, uh, starting with AUSA Kazenstein. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everybody. I can't see you, but um, hello. Um, to use David's um, rubric of pay and chase, I think I must in introduce myself as the chaser in chief. <laughs> I, am the, uh, I am the chief of the major fraud section of the United States Attorney's Office here in the Central District of California. In that capacity, I oversee and supervise 24 attorneys in my office. I provide assistance. Those are the people in the major fraud section. I advise and provide guidance to people in other sections working financial frauds. And I supervise a group of seven uh, trial attorneys who are here from DOJ working healthcare fraud cases. I also, uh, for purposes of today, I am the coordinator of the PPP enforcement efforts in our district. I also coordinate other enforcement efforts for other programs under the CARES Act and uh, designed by the government and Congress to address the financial fallout from the pandemic, most particularly the unemployment insurance benefits fraud, which is rampant, not just in California, but across the country. Um, we also, uh, my section also deals with the um, personal protective equipment fraud, hoard, hoarding and price gouging issues, all kinds of things that have been brought to us by the fallout of the pandemic. And before I continue, I will just say that all of my remarks today are being made in my personal capacity. They do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Justice. Thank you. Mana? Thanks, David. Um, so my name is Mana Lombardo. I'm a partner in the Government Contracts Group at Kroll & Mooring LLP uh, here in our Los Angeles office. I also serve on the firm's False Claims Act Steering Committee, um, as well as our Paycheck Protection Program Task Force, um, through which we've been counseling clients in a variety of industries on dealing with uh, forgiveness and eligibility issues related to the PPP, um, as well as um, helping clients to uh, prepare for any of the potential audits and enforcement actions that we expect to see coming down the line. 
Um, so with that, I just want to take a moment to thank the Beverly Hills Bar Association for inviting me here today. I'm um, very happy to be here. Thank you, Mona. Uh, Vince? Thanks, David. Thanks for including me. My name is Vince Farhat. I'm the chair of the White Collar Defense and Investigations Group at Jeffrey Mangles. Before re-entering private practice, I was in AUSA in the major fraud section here in Los Angeles. I had the opportunity to work with Ronnie. I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Um, last year, Jeffrey Mangles uh, formed our COVID-19 Resource Center. The Resource Center provides strategic and operational counsel to businesses um, that are dealing with the regulatory and compliance and commercial impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm a member of the Resource Center. I've been working with companies on PPP uh, compliance issues, as well as assisting clients in responding to investigations, uh, as well as counseling them around the areas of price gouging for rental housing, as well as for PPE, um, and also supply chain compliance issues. I appreciate the chance to be here today. Great, thank you also. I think um, you'll see even from the introductions that we should get a diversity of uh, viewpoints here today. And by the way, like Vince, I am also a former member of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the major fraud sections, and Ronnie is one of my mentors. And so um, I think we all feel very lucky to have her and uh, really thank her for her time. But in terms of perspectives, we're going to get the, the chaser in chief um, <laughs> uh, on the criminal side. Uh, um, Mana, as you heard, has a deep experience with the False Claims Act and civil enforcement. Um, and, and Vince, uh, you, you know, represents clients uh, frequently that are under investigation for these things. So we're trying to give you uh, viewpoints from all of the sort of critical perspectives and hopefully uh, this group can do that. So why don't we start with the criminal side? Um, uh, Ronnie, you're the uh, USAO's uh, PPP fraud coordinator. Um, I'd like to just get into that a little bit. What does that role entail? So um, what I do in that capacity falls into sort of three categories. I receive referrals and review those referrals, make the initial decisions whether or not they are matters that we want to proceed on. If we decide that it is a matter that we want to open and look at, uh, getting, for example, a law enforcement agent involved, getting an AUSA involved. Um, if we make that decision, and that's usually a decision I make, although there's some other people in the office uh, who are involved, um, I decide where that should go. So intake and then assignment. And, um, and then the third area, of course, is trying to do some education within the office, helping people to learn how best to prosecute these types of cases, how best to develop the evidence and make prosecutive decisions with respect to them, and also doing some outreach to the community like today. And you mentioned uh, that the position is a coordinator role. Is the PPP coordinator a unique position or are there other coordinators in the major fraud section? Oh, there are many coordinators um, in the major fraud section because we uh, cover a vast array of matters. So we have a healthcare fraud coordinator. David, I believe you may have been one of those when you were in our uh, office. Um, we have a coordinator who looks at financial institution fraud. We have a defense procurement coordinator. We have a coordinator for tax referrals. We cover a vast amount of real estate um, in our section. Right. So the PPP coordinator is one of many sort of subject matter experts. It is. Okay. Uh, thanks. So um, you mentioned uh, referrals. Um, where do the referrals come from, especially in this PPP space? So as you can imagine, I often tell people um, there's no pot of government money, state or federal, that somebody isn't trying to rip off. And the referrals in this area are many. Uh, they come from a variety of places. For example, most obviously, like most fraud matters, victims will come forward when they've been victimized. So that is, in this instance, often the banks. The banks have records, the banks see what's going on, they have um, people in their own 
institutions who are there to uh, who are very well trained and uh, ex expert in detecting fraud and developing uh, referrals in that area. So the banks are one large source for us. But when you talk about victims in these types of cases, there are other types of victims, for example, individuals whose names are used, whose identities are stolen to perpetrate the fraud. Um, those are victims and they may discover that their name has been used because they're being contacted by a bank or another agency and they don't know anything about it. We'll get referrals that way as well. More significantly, in this area, we do data analytics, and um, we do data analytics. I hope I'm not, you know, <laughs> telling people a secrets here, but the government does data analytics in a variety of areas. We do them in the healthcare area, for example, which uh, David knows very well. We and and so does Vince, of course. We do them in tax enforcement. We do them in defense procurement enforcement. We use data analytics. And here, because of the extent of documentary evidence and documentary issues in these loan applications, these are a very good uh, area to use those tools. So we do use that quite a bit, looking at corporate documents, financial institution documents, tax documents. That's a basis for us to generate referrals internally. Each of the law enforcement agencies that we work with and that specialize in these areas do their own data analytics as well. So that's another important source. I should say you might also be surprised to know that sometimes the individuals who we prosecute are themselves a source. For instance, and this is typical of fraud cases generally, an individual who is, to use the technical term, dead to rights in a matter, may want to come forward and help him or herself out by revealing to us information he or she may have about other people engaging in similar frauds. All of those sources are ones that we use to develop our cases. I should say, since the uh, PPP program has been in place, the government writ large, not just my office, but the Department of Justice and the US Attorney's offices around the country have brought cases against approximately, we're closing in on 200 defendants. That may not sound like a lot, but it is an extraordinary number, given that this program has only been in place for less than a year, and that white collar cases of this sort are often time consuming to put together. So we are working very, very hard to not only take and review referrals, but move them forward. Uh with respect to, you, you mentioned victims and data analytics, are they um, sort of mutually exclusive uh, sources of um, referrals or do they sometimes work together? They can work together, of course. I mean, we, we may get a lead and then uh, through data analytics and then contact a victim for more information or vice versa. Uh, more often, what will happen is a bank will suggest to us that they have a loan application is fraudulent, and then we'll use data analytics to discover whether or not there are other loan applications connected to that first one, suggesting a larger operation. You, you mentioned that there were a number of agencies that also did their own diligence on the data analytics. What federal agencies are um, most active in this PPP enforcement space? So, of course, the Small Business Administration Office of Inspector General is quite active in this area, but that is a relatively small agency. Um, the FBI is very active. IRS is extremely active. Uh, the FDIC, OIG, the Federal Reserve Bank, OIG, many, many agencies, even the postal inspectors are helping us out. It's a very large problem. Uh, it's a kind of all hands on deck approach that we have. Uh, you know, just because um, not everybody uh, that's listening might be familiar with sort of the federal criminal system, can you uh, describe in a little bit of detail what an OIG is? An OIG, OIG stands for Office of Inspector General. 
people. And that is often, you know, the agencies have a vast array of responsibilities and they will have within themselves a unit, the Office of Inspector General, which is often dedicated to looking at criminal enforcement. That's what an OIG is. And so every, most federal agencies have their own OIG, so their own sort of police or enforcement branch. Yes, right. uh, IRS, of course, doesn't call it OIG. IRS calls it criminal investigations. Um, EDD, for instance, calls it a criminal investigations. But it is a unit that is designed to do investigation of criminal uh, enforcement matters. And we have a, a question um, from the audience, uh, whether or not there's a trend among the U.S. attorney's offices nationwide to create a PPP fraud coordinator position and whether or not other U.S. attorney's offices in California have them? So uh, thanks for that question. Um, every office I believe in the country is working on this and has somebody helping out in the office. The Department of Justice uh, in the fraud section back in Washington also has people dedicated to this. They have been taking the lead on some of the data analytics and the U.S. attorney's offices across the country country often partner with them. We've partnered with them in a number of matters, um, but uh, we coordinate. I mean, it, this is high on the priority list for the Department of Justice. Coordination is up at the top right now. Right. So we have um, a high priority area. Um, we have victims. We have data analytics. Um, you have likely, you know, many um, issues that are brought to your attention. How do you triage all of that? So um, to answer that question, let me tell you a little bit about how I view the types of cases that are being referred to us generally. I would say we, they come into sort of two tiers. The first tier is the cases involving an individual who has, for example, gotten a loan under false pretenses or gotten a loan in the name of a fake company or taken the money and you know whatever the amount they have received and bought the infamous Lamborghini or gone to Las Vegas and gambled with the money. That's one type of case and it is relatively discreet, the criminal conduct. A second type of case, the second tier, are the organized rings. And those are very significant matters. There can be as many as um, 15 people in a ring. They file multiple loans. It's very coordinated, um, very organized, and very harmful. It is lots and lots of money. The organized ring cases we keep in the major fraud section, and we do those. Um, they require a little more sophistication and a little more work. Um, the other types of cases are excellent cases for what we call our general crime section. Those people can, those AUSAs work on more reactive cases, more quick cases. Uh, we divide them up that way. And of course, cases that originate out of Orange County or Riverside go to our branch offices. We have a branch office in Orange County and a branch office in Riverside. So um, your focus as a major fraud chief on the organized uh, crime rings um, are there any examples, uh, you know, from this district or elsewhere that you could um, describe to the group so they have a little bit more context? Sure. We recently indicted uh, four individuals who obtained a number of loans in the name. They were using fake identities. Some of them were stolen identities. Some of them are what we call synthetic identities. That is to say, a fake name and a true social security number, which doesn't correspond to the name. Um, they were using fake companies and getting multiple loans, using the money, having the money deposited into bank accounts in the fake that they had opened in the fake names of the companies and identities to shield themselves from being detected. They then transferred the money to buy properties in Los Angeles. We, I should say, we don't merely um, prosecute people to put them in prison, we also prosecute them to take away the fruits of their crime. And in those instances, we will seize the property. We, we are very aggressive about that. Even before we bring criminal charges, we can get seizure warrants, which we do. 
And uh, so mentioning seizure warrants and sort of the technical aspect of it, what types of statutes are um, available to the federal government to address uh, these issues right. on the criminal side? So let me just say, um, you know, how does the federal government have a hook into these, a criminal hook into these cases? The reason we have a criminal hook is that in the application process, the applicant or the representative of the applicant the applying company has to make certain certifications. They have to acknowledge that they have are familiar with the rules that govern the program. And then they have to certify that they will use the money to retain workers and to maintain payroll or to make mortgage interest payments, lease payments and utility payments of the applying company. They must make that certification. They also have to use the money properly, and often they provide documents to support the certifications that they make. By doing that, because the applications in the first instance, instance are provided to the banks, to the federal institutions that provide the funds, those certifications are statements made to a federal institu a financial institution. A false statement to a federal financial institution can be prosecuted federally under a number of statutes. 1014, which has a 30 year stat max. Uh, 1344, the bank fraud statute, which has a 30 year stat max. Um, 1014 is the uh, false statements in a loan application statute. We use those. If somebody applies and puts a false name on the document or uses some, uses an identity theft victim's name in the application, we can get an, a, what's called an aggravated identity theft charge. That is, to use a technical term, a hammer, because the judge is required, is mandatory, that the judge impose an additional two years on top of whatever sentence the judge imposes for the related offense. So an aggravated identity theft means you've used somebody's ID to um, to commit another felony. That's a very serious charge that we can bring. Also, because the money for the, um, these loans, the loan proceeds are provided to the applicant by being wired into their bank accounts, those wires allow us to bring wire fraud charges. The wire fraud statute, which is 18 U.S.C. 1343, has a 20-year stat max. So all of those are available to us. Obviously, depending on other conduct, if, for example, somebody were to lie during the course of an investigation, we would have a charge available to us under a thousand and one, the section 1001 of Title 18. The loan applications also involve um, tax documents to support the applications. Depending on the facts of a particular case, we might have available to us um, the criminal statutes under the tax code, which is Title 26. It sounds like you have plenty of options <laughs> uh, to prosecute. And um, just as a, uh, a segue to our next panelist, um, when you are doing a, a criminal investigation um, into these types of issues that involve federal money. Um, is there anybody that you typically partner with? Yes, we, uh, as I often say to AUSAs in my office, we have a, a vast array of tools to address wrongdoing and in particular wrongdoing that um, drains the federal coffers. Uh, those tools are available to us not only through the federal prosecution, criminal prosecution, and through seizure warrants and forfeiture, but we also partner with the civil division, which has available to it a number of uh, injunction statute, uh, an injunction statute that it can use. It has other um, false claims uh, uh, prosecution. Well, I shouldn't call it prosecution, but they can use the False Claims Act, again, to provide some forms of enforcement. We partner with them. It is a priority of the Department of Justice to use all available tools in coordination with one another to achieve maximum results and maximum recovery for the public. Thank you. Um, very helpful. So uh, you mentioned the False Claims Act, MANA. 
Uh, can you tell us what that is? Of course. So the Federal False Claims Act, also known as the FCA, is essentially the government's most powerful tool for enforcing and investigating and, and punishing civil fraud. So by contrast with all the criminal discussion we just had, we're kind of delving into the civil section now. And the Department of Justice recovers billions of dollars a year under the False Claims Act. Um, and as uh, we're noting here, the PPP, um, it just raises a whole new avenue of recovery that um, is obviously certainly on the government's radar. Um, as to who can be liable under the False Claims Act, um, any individual or business that uh, knowingly submits or causes another to submit a false claim to the government, um, or if they make a false record or statement uh, in order to get a claim paid by the government, they can be liable under the FCA. Um, you mentioned uh, the False Claims Act. Does, does that, um, in your experience, go by any other names, just so people understand that it might be referred to in different ways? Is it yeah, and, and I probably will throughout call it the FCA, but generally it's, it's uh, shorthand referred to as the FCA. And um, sometimes uh, I, I've also heard people refer to it as a key TAM. Is that, is that also? Yes, definitely. So one of the procedural aspects of the False Claims Act that's, that's really interesting um, is that it's not just a, a federal law that allows the United States government to bring suit, um, but it also has a private attorney general provision, which allows a whistleblower known as a key TAM relator um, to step into the government's shoes and to file a suit on behalf of the government. So once a whistleblower files a suit, um, the government has the opportunity to investigate and make a decision as to whether or not it wants to intervene in the case. Um, and even if the government declines to join the case, and during that time, the case remains under seal. Um, but even if the government declines to join a case, the whistleblower, the key time relator can go forward with that suit um, and if there's any recovery, whether it's via settlement or verdict, um, the whistleblower is able to receive a portion of those proceeds that would otherwise be, you know, the government's recruitment. Um, so whistleblower, um, I know you, you practice in the False Claims Act regularly. Where do these whistleblowers typically come from? So, you know, it, it can be various locations. I mean, one thing, because it, PPP loans can be um, enforced and liability against PPP um, fraud can be enforced under the Civil False Claims Act. Um, borrowers need to be aware that the suit is not just going to be necessarily triggered by the government investigation, but by the whistleblower. And those whistleblowers could be your own internal employees. Um, sometimes we see often disgruntled employees who bring these whistleblower suits. It could be a former employee um, and sometimes it can be even a competitor, um, an individual at a competing company that somehow learned of uh, some impropriety with regard to the loans in this case. And they're incentivized, of course, for bringing these suits because of you know, the opportunity to receive a portion of the recovery. So what you're saying is our disgruntled uh, current and former employees and competitors are watching us and are able to get money if they bring a successful claim? Exactly. How much right. um, can they typically recover? The, the whistleblower. Yeah, so it just depends on whether or not the United States um, intervenes into the case uh, and, you know, the decision on the settlement in, in some aspects. But ultimately, it's either going to be 15 to 30 percent of the entire proceeds. And traditionally, as we're talking about government contracts, these are these are large contracts. In the case of PPP loans, the original ones could be up to $10 million. So it's a significant amount of money. So um, we heard from the criminal side on so, some of the more typical liability theories. Um, you know, how, how, does a, the, how does the FCA work and what are some of the more typical theories that would be used against loan recipients? Okay, so let me start with a little bit about the basics of the FCA. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention here is that it's important to know that uh, knowledge of the falsity, right? You're, it's, it's based on a false statement to the government, much like the criminal statutes we discuss. But here, knowledge of the falsity under the FCA has a relatively lower bar. So it could be actual knowledge, 
but it may also be either deliberate ignorance or reckless disregard of the truth or the fa falsity of a statement. So if you have a statement made that's submitted to the US government seeking federal funds like uh, PPP loan forgiveness, and the loan itself and the forgiveness, um, that can be the basis of liability even um, if it's not actual knowledge about the falsity. So that could be the false certifications that are certifying compliance with regulatory or statutory requirements. Um, and, and so that's where the liability can be if a person or entity just recklessly, recklessly disregards the truthfulness of the statements. Um, there's also in this arena, there's potential for a reverse false claim. Um, and that's where an individual uh, or a business knowingly and improperly avoids um, a duty they might have to pay money to the government. So in the context of a PPP loan, a reverse false claim might arise um, if in the context of seeking forgiveness or uh, failing or refusing to return the funds once the borrower uh, understands that they didn't actually qualify under the PPP. And I can tell you a little bit about the damages because that's going to be uh, relevant as well. So the consequences under the False Claims Act are pretty severe. Um, the civil damages and penalties, they're actually quite draconian. Um, the law mandates trouble damages, uh, and also civil penalties of between um, approximately $11,000 and $22,000 for each false statement made to the government. Um, and so that can ultimately result in uh, monetary repercussions that are over three times the amount of the actual loan that was taken out. And that's, of course, in addition to collateral consequences like the reputational harm or um, in, the, in the instance of a government contractor, possible suspension or debarment. So are you saying, um, you know, if somebody took a $10 million loan and were found liable under the False Claims Act, they could be liable for, you know, up to $30 million? Yes, $30 million plus potential penalties. And how big can those penalties be? Well, in the case of the PPP loan, it might be an area where the penalties would be um, uh, less voluminous just because there's only so many false statements that you probably made in the application process, but each, each false statement would, would constitute a penalty and they can be maxed at about $22,000 and change. And Ronnie, not to put you on the spot, but you heard Mana describe the relatively um, low knowledge bar for false claims act cases. How does that compare to the cases that you're pursuing? Well, of course, uh, criminal cases have the highest bar, and appropriately so, uh, in order to establish guilt of any of the offenses that we talked about, which were offenses we could charge in a criminal case, we would have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the individual, for example, in the uh, fraudulent statements on an application, we'd have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person certifying those statements, uh, that the statements were false and that the person knew they were false. That can be uh, tricky sometimes. Uh, sometimes people rely on other individuals to provide information to them. If they've relied in good faith, that means that uh, they didn't necessarily have the wrongful intent that we need to establish criminal liability. Uh, in some of our criminal cases, we, I mean, I, I, I'm going to digress for just a moment, David, and just for an example, you know, the volume of these loan applications has been very great, and the banks are somewhat overwhelmed. And sometimes we have bank application, we have applications where there are false, st the, the statements are not true. Uh, for example, an individual expects to have a payroll of 200 individuals, but doesn't have it now. And he puts down that he has 200 individuals, but he says, I anticipate that. And banks approve that because the banks make mistakes. In that instance, we can't charge that as a false statement. The person has disclosed information appropriately. So the criminal side, again, you have to show that it's a knowing false statement, that the person made it, with an intent to defraud and that they didn't rely on advice of some professional telling them that it was okay uh, to make that statement. So, so Mana, taking this away from the sort of theoretical to the real, 
Um, have there been false claims act enforcement actions uh, involving the PPP? Yes, there have. So, um, well, the one of the very first ones that just got announced last January was um, the Department of Justice had its first FCA settlement involving allegations of PPP fraud, and it was a company called Slide Belt Inc., and so it was a retail company, um, and its CEO uh, ended up agreeing to resolve um, that liability by paying $100,000 in penalties and damages um, under the FCA and also FERREA, which is a, a, a criminal act that uh, Vince will touch on. But as far as the FCA part of the settlement, um, it's really the first in a line of a long line, I think, of recoveries that we're going to see in the months and years to come based on um, applications for PPP loans. So the facts of this case were that Slide Belts filed a petition for bankruptcy relief. Um, and the PPP application, one of the many certifications that you have to be aware of, um, as well as the SBA's rules, explicitly prohibit um, debtors that are in bankruptcy proceedings from either at the time of the application or um, before the loan funds are dispersed from receiving PPP funds. Um, but nevertheless, in this case, uh, Slide Belts and its CEO uh, applied for a PPP loan of approximately $300,000. Um, and then they applied for a second loan at a second financial institution for approximately $350,000 PPP loan. Um, and then when the first financial institution discovered that uh, Slide Belt and its CEO had falsely certified that they were uh, not in bankruptcy proceedings when they actually were, they rejected the loan for that reason. Um, but the very same day, Slide Belts and the CEO actually went to a third uh, institution and went ahead and um, uh, reapplied again and again falsely stated and certified that they were not um, in bankruptcy proceedings. So ultimately in that case, what happened was the, um, the second bank uh, was induced to provide a $350,000 loan based on the false statements. And they, they did so. So, you know, the government uh, found out about this and um, they came to the settlement agreement, which is interesting because even though the settlement am amount is only $100,000, the potential claims could have been $4 million. And the government here um, settled it based on the financial ability of the company and its CEO. So, um, I think, so in addition to the $100,000, they did have to pay the $350,000 loan bank back in the settlement. But I think what's really interesting here is I think it's a really good case example under the False Claims Act that the government is going to be aggressive in pursuing this kind of PPP fraud, even if you, um, you know, you're, despite financial background and financial ability, despite whether or not the company has had any prior government contract experience, and maybe even despite the low value of the loan, again, relatively. Is that the first False Claims Act? Yeah, that's the first False Claims Act case that was announced. Um, you know, there can be many more under um, SEAL right now, and I can probably just tick through a few examples of how we might see some of these come through. Um, you know, I think in the first instance, there's uh, issues regarding eligibility, right? So a PPP borrower could face exposure for any of the um, purported false statements about eligibility it makes in the certification on the application loan for the loan, right? And including any supporting documents as, as um, Ronnie mentioned, like those supporting documents are going to be part of that file. As well, so if you you know take the example of size eligibility, um, the first PPP loans under the CARES Act, um, they had a maximum size eligibility of 500 employees in order to qualify, with some exceptions and alternative size examples um, available, st size standards available. And then um, the, for the second round loans, uh, a borrower could have a maximum of 300 different kinds of 
of 300 employees in order to be qualified for the second draw loan. But so in any case, whenever a borrower sought out a, a loan, they need to certify their eligibility under the size standards. And it also incorporates SBA's um, pretty complex affiliation rules in terms of assessing your size, um, meaning that you have to assess whether your uh, headcount is, um, what your total headcount is going to be based on the size of your company as well as the size of your affiliates. So borrowers really need to understand those rules that determine whether or not other folks are counted as part of other part of their headcount. And you need to be aware that misstating that eligibility um, by not counting the uh, employees of all the affiliates can essentially be a false statement and that can bring exposure for exit liability. So I, I think um, we're all appropriately scared um, between Ronnie uh, pursuing the criminal charges and trying to put um, uh, our clients in jail and, you know, <laughs> Mana's uh, discussion of trouble damages where we're going to have to pay three times the amount that we got. Um, if we might have made some mistakes along the way, uh, even uh, without actual knowledge, which um, is what it is. Uh, Vince, um, I know we have about 14 minutes left. You know, what are we supposed to do about all of this? How do we avoid an enforcement action? And what do we do if somebody starts asking questions? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that um, that's a big question. I think what you said at the beginning of the program, it's critical to, to bear in mind, which is this idea that the government put this money out there very quickly, and again, you know, understandably, uh, put the government in the position of paying and chasing. And in fact, in addition to the False Claims Act, as Mana mentioned, there's also FIREA. And if we had more time, we could step into that and talk a little bit about that. That's another civil statute that allows the government to essentially take a criminal fraud statute um, and turn it into a preponderance of the evidence um, statute. And so there's a, in fact, the slide belts case mentioned and referenced FIREA. Um, and it's something that we should, you know, if we have more time, we could spend some time on that. Um, it's another civil enforcement statute. And I believe that uh, the next wave of enforcement is likely going to be, uh, in addition to criminal enforcement, civil enforcement. You know, the, the statute requires that companies maintain their records for six years following the conclusion of the loan. That gives the government six long years within which to investigate, audit, and review uh, PPP loan applications. And from a compliance standpoint, you know, PPP is a compliance minefield. You have the certifications on the front end regarding eligibility. You have the forgiveness requirements. And the other complicating factor from the perspective of the companies that I work with is that the guidance has been a bit of a moving target. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, the uh, SBA uh, issued additional guidance on uh, PPP and small business forgiveness and how to calculate uh, for forgiveness. And from a standpoint, like you said, David, many companies receiving PPP monies are not large companies. They're not used to being government contractors. Uh, they don't have robust compliance departments. And what they've tried to do, operating in a warp speed environment, is to make judgment calls about whether they're eligible and trying in good faith to comply. So yes, we've seen a lot of uh, obvious cases, what I would call of obvious lying, cheating, and stealing, the Lamborghinis. There's been the you know, chaser in chief's office has been definitely focused on those. The more difficult cases and the cases that I believe that folks like Mana and I will be working on for the next six years are cases where companies tried in good faith to comply with the program requirements, but unintentionally or unknowingly made representations that after the fact uh, turned out to be not true, false or misleading in some way, um, because of, in some cases, vague and ambiguous regulations, vague and ambiguous rules. And really making this matters, making matters worse is the fact that the guidance appears to be changing and it changes and it's very difficult for companies to do that. Um, so what can they do to manage risk? They can be ready. They can be ready by adopting good compliance programs now and also making sure that they're ready to respond to government investigations. Uh, for all the reasons that Mana mentioned, because these uh, loans are really um, minefields for compliance, it's critically important that companies maintain 
accurate and contemporaneous documentation. Um, contemporaneous because the most credible documentation is documentation that's done in the moment. And certainly investigators look for that. Accurate insofar as that even if they're not perfect, the company is making a good faith effort to uh, maintain documentation around the decision to apply for the loan and how they calculated for forgiveness. The other thing that a company can do and should do is to adopt standard procedures for, adopt, for responding to audits, subpoenas, knock and talks, and search warrants. Now, sometimes clients ask, well, why do I need to develop a standard procedure uh, to respond to a search warrant? I didn't do anything wrong. Well, perfectly innocent companies get searched all the time. Certainly companies might receive a subpoena request or an, inqu or, or an inquiry from law enforcement. It's critically important that companies be ready to respond in a way that's clear and documented so that there's not a misunderstanding that arises between law enforcement and the company. Standard reporting procedures and response procedures are an important part of a company's compliance plan. You know, from my perspective, and I think Mana will be able to add her own perspective because she practices in the space as well. Um, from my standpoint, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I have what I consider to be 10 best practices, which start with understanding the rules, documenting the rules, implementing protocols to monitor how the funds are being spent, training your employees on, on proper documentation, and training your employees on how to effectively respond to law enforcement inquiries. So again, there's not a misunderstanding between the company uh, and the um, government in the event of an investigation. Certainly documenting current business activity and how that had been negatively impacted by COVID-19 is critical to documenting that downturn in business. Uh, keeping track of the business projections that you made in deciding to take out the loan, projected payroll needs, no alternative sources of liquidity and things like that. Documenting employee counts, compensation levels, keeping contemporaneous receipts and logs. Because again, as I noted before, after the fact records are viewed as less credible by investigators as contemporaneous records. Um, and of course, looking at the current guidance uh, and the guidance changes, but to really look on a weekly basis or work with a trusted advisor to check on that guidance and make sure you're following it, setting up an internal monitoring system as well. Those are some of the points that I had in mind and maybe Mana, from your experience, you've been advising companies as well your perspective on effective compliance. Thanks, Vince. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I think I, one of the components I want to echo here is the contemporaneous documentation, right? This is going to go to your eligibility and to the forgiveness criteria. And part of that is, um, you know, you're going to document not just your lost revenues, um, and your lack of liquidity at the time of the loan, you're, you're, you're doing it because you're thinking ahead to the possible audits that might come down the line and even uh, the questionnaires that may be submitted to you by the Small Business Administration through the banks. So for example, one of the certifications on the um, loan form is basically what we call the economic necessity cert, where you have to be able to certify that um, the, the loan request is necessary during due to the economic uncertainty of the applicant um, um, and their ongoing operations at the time. So that's exactly why Vince was referring to documenting your current business activity and what other liquid sources you may have had at the time of the loan, because you may be required to essentially prove up that um, there was an economic need at the time when you applied for the loan. And those are the kind of guidance, those, those buzzwords of other liquid sources are the kind of guidance that we've received from the um, Small Business Administration and Treasury with regard to how they're going to be assessing these things. They, they recently even issued a questionnaire that the banks have been directed to issue to um, at minimum those uh, borrowers who've received loans of over $2 million. And the questionnaire 
is it requires information, documentation, financials to be submitted to the bank to essentially support the economic need. Um, so documenting it and documenting it comprehensively is a really important thing to do. Um, and you know that's the kind of thing we've helped clients with reviewing to make sure that the sufficiency and comprehension, comprehensiveness of their documentation um, is all there. I, I think another best practice, and this is a little bit out of the wheelhouse just for compliance, is um, exactly the ounce of prevention that you're talking about. Um, on the whistleblower front, because a lot of times uh, there are employees who state their grievances in terms of um, they might have an issue they take with the way that they see PPP loans being used, um, it's really important for companies to be aware of, listen to, um, investigate, and really take seriously any employee grievances related how to the PPP loan, how those funds are being used, um, because those are the same folks that might later become um, the whistleblowers, whistleblowers of the future if they don't feel like their complaints and grievances have been heard. So that's always the best practice as well. Thank you. So and I would note uh, regarding FARIA, the statute that I briefly mentioned, it too has whistleblower provisions. Um, and so the government has said in the past that they believe that they can uh, investigate both, both FIREA and FCA claims on the same facts. Now, query whether that might uh, implicate or violate the recent no piling on uh, guidance from DOJ, but certainly the, the, the government has in the past said that in a case they could pursue regarding the same conduct, both FIREA and FCA claims. Um, and so it's important to remember that FIREA also includes whistleblower provisions um, and you need to be thinking about compliance with that statute as well. Thank you. So we're three minutes to go um, and there's a few housekeeping matters, but really quickly, last question for each member of the panel, um, starting uh, with Ronnie, what should we expect to see next? <laughs> Um, I, I checked my crystal ball before I came today, and I think what we will be seeing next are potentially uh, false statements and certifications being made on the forgiveness side of this. Uh, we've been talking about fraud and the inducement, fraud, fraudulent statements on the applications, but of course, uh, down the road, when people want to get the loan forgiven, they're going to have to file various bits of paperwork with respect to that. On that side, that's, I think, the, the, next, uh, the next phase. But right now, we have our hands full with uh, with the first phase, uh, with uh, in particular with the gangs that are the, the gangs of people who are uh, taking advantage of this program, which is designed to help people and tragically is being used as an opportunity for self enrichment. Thank you, Mana. Um, I would say that there's a couple things we're going to see. First of all, um, movement on the civil side, civil side from not just seeing these slam dunk blatant fraud cases, but um, I, really the government digging into the more difficult and complex ones where borrowers um, are grappling with the complex rules of the SBA. And then, you know, there's going to be an issue as to whether or not they um, properly com complied and made accurate statements on all their certifications, both on the loan side and on the forgiveness side. Um, the other thing that I would say uh, that we expect to see coming down the pipeline is more and many, many whistleblower suits. Um, because as, as you recall, there's a lag period for when the Department of Justice gets to um, bring a suit versus the time they take to investigate it. So there may be already plenty of whistleblower cases under seal um, that the government is currently evaluating, but as those are um, the, those investigations are conducted and completed, we're gonna see some of those suits um, uh, unsealed and both the government and the key TAM relators alike pursuing them. Vince. Well, I'm, for I'm fortunate to be last so that I can say I agree with both of our panelists. 100%. This time next year, we will see dozens and dozens of false claims cases um, being investigated. The coming wave of civil enforcement is coming. Great. And I, I know there are some uh, questions asked by the audience that, that I apologize. Um, we didn't have a chance to get to. We were very short of time and I want to do a few housekeeping matters. Um, but I, I'm sure, um, you know, maybe the panel, if they're willing or if they have time, could stay after to address some of these questions. 
But while we have everybody, I just want to um, put out to the section and to the others that attended that we're setting up panels for the rest of the year. Um, we'll reach out once they get scheduled, but we would love input and participation from other members. So if you have any ideas for panels or would like to participate, um, please contact me. Um, we're also going to ho hopefully set up a networking event uh, at some point this year. Um, and lastly, the section is also looking for other volunteers who may be interested in leadership roles. Um, you know, uh, openings include vice chair, secretary, or programming chair, or if there's other position that you might be interested in. Besides those, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get some more participation and support. Um, and lastly, you will be receiving your uh, MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Um, I know the BHBA would appreciate it if people would take a moment to complete the survey um, that's included with the certificate. So with that, that's the conclusion of the um, uh, panel. We do appreciate everybody's time and so really many thanks to the panelists, um, Ronnie, Vince, and Mana. Uh, know that uh, this took a lot of time to prepare for and we do appreciate everybody's time.